Okay. Right, so then the idea would be that um, we can continue to cover things on Wednesday, or if uh, people would like an opportunity to stop and sort of review um, some of the things from earlier in the semester that they think might come up on this. Now the final exam, which um, uh, the way I plan the structure, it'll be sometime um, at it's either going to be, so our final was originally scheduled for Friday of finals week. And so nominally, um, I would just release the final exam on Canvas uh, that you could take any time you wanted to start it on Friday of finals week and you get something like 75 minutes. Uh, once you start it, you get that 75 minutes, maybe a little bit more for any technical uh, issues. Um, and um, and then, uh, then you end it and you're not able to see your score until the next day. Um, there have been a couple of people who have asked, is there any way they could take the final exam a little sooner? Um, I can do that, but the instant I open up the final exam window, then I can't answer any other technical questions. And so um, that, so that's kind of a, uh, I don't mind, you know, opening the window up earlier. It means I have to get the exam done a little sooner, but if that provides flexibility, I'm happy to do that. But again, then it would mean that I couldn't you know, answer a question because it might be that somebody is um, somehow brings up a question that they found out that was on the exam and, you know, seeks for clarifying. Uh, and that wouldn't be, you know, fair to everybody as they, you know, go through the timing of the exam. So um, ideally, I would like to just open it on Friday, um, but I know there have been some questions about. So just add as an informal poll. So at the bottom of the participants list, you can give a vote. Um, it, you know, if you use the yes or the no buttons, how many people would like the exam to be opened up sooner than Friday of final exam week, given that you won't be able to ask questions once it's opened up? Okay, looking for votes coming in. Looks like right now there is a strong majority um, for not opening it up early. Um, so the message that, um, yeah, I think it's May 8th is the, yeah, thanks Emily for the, the chat. Um, so, so it looks like at least of the those attending the live lecture here, there is a strong uh, a majority for, and then some a couple messages in the chat for uh, for just opening it up Friday, and then allowing for Monday through Thursday for any questions. Um, there's a couple people who'd like earlier, but almost everybody else um, seems to be you know voicing Friday. All right, I will take that into consideration. Um, I will tell you that especially if you make use of those homework assignments that I've recently put online, um, then the those should be excellent preparation for the kinds of questions that you will see on the final exam. So, um, so if if you haven't noticed it, I've put uh, like four or five um, homework assignments based on the past units. I've given everybody default grades of zero, and then I've extended the um, automatic. Um, uh, and I'll answer that question, Madison, in a second. And I've extended the the drop policy so that no one is penalized by not taking those. But if you take them, it could only bring your score up higher. And uh, right now they're due at the end of this week, but I will probably just leave them open and accessible, even though they'll be technically still due. They'll be due at the end of this week because this is like the end of regulation, but I'll leave them open and available. And even if you didn't do them, um, I won't like mark them late. And so uh, that way those can be study materials for the final exam that will come up on Friday. And so, um, so again, so there, there's a question, would I, could I extend the deadline until Sunday? What I'm probably going to do is, I, because I, I technically, this, you know, the, the class ends on Friday, so I'm going to make them due on Friday, but there will be no penalty for doing them until the final exam. So basically, let's say the final exam ends up being on Friday, then I will allow you to do them, like you'll still be able to access them. Canvas will mark them as late, but your score won't be penalized at all. And so if you don't want to do them this week, if you'd like to wait for the weekend to do them, that'll be fine. I just, in order to sort of like keep with the official ASU schedule, I will make them due on Friday, this Friday. All right. So any other administrative questions about that? 
for those that came in a little late, um, looks like the um, uh, majority of uh, folks here um, are in favor of having the final exam basically on Friday of finals week. So you get um, 24 hours starting Friday at midnight. Uh, Friday, at the, you know, the very, you know, so you've got all of Friday of finals week to start the exam and get about 75, 85 minutes to complete the exam. Um, the timer starts from wherever you start the exam. Um, and Friday uh, is the earliest you could take the exam uh, because um, that allows people to ask content questions all the way up in it. And finals week is um, next week. So we're talking about a week from this Friday. So this would be May 8th. And uh, so then, do I know the approximate number of questions? Um, I don't know off the top of my head. What, I, um, what I'm probably going to do is look at how long people have taken to, on average, to complete the homework assignments, and then give them the, an idea of, of roughly how long it takes people to complete these types of questions, and then scale that so that the average person could finish the exam in, I don't know, a half hour, 35 minutes, and then that way there's some people that will end up real early and other people will end up taking um, the, the amount of time. I, I don't like um, to generate exams that keep people there the whole time. Um, I like to have a distribution of people that some finish early and some finish late. So um, I'm not going to like take advantage of the 75 minutes and, and you know, so uh, I want it so that the majority of people will feel like they've had more than enough time. And again, the real focus of the end of this course is getting a solid final project, not um, the final exam. The final exam is just there to sort of make sure you're paying attention to the survey material that we go through in these bio-inspired algorithms. Okay, and um, yeah, again, for and there's I just see questions in the chat. I'm just covering mention this again. The plan right now is um, Friday of finals week, which is May 8th. You get all day to start the exam. Once you start it, you get at least 75 minutes to complete it maybe a little bit longer to deal with any technical snafus. Uh, and then once that time period hits, you'll be locked out of the exam for you. And then once the day ends, then the correct answers will be released the next day. Uh, there's a question about the report. Is the four page limit a hard limit? Um, yeah, try to make your, I mean, I'm not going to, I don't have a specific like penalty, but um, for going over, but I can't guarantee that I'm gonna you know, keep reading. Um, you know, after that four page limit, it's supposed to be an exercise and coming with a concise argument where, um, where you have basically shown me that you have the ability to synthesize one of these algorithms, take it in, understand it, and then give it back to me um, and uh, in both a description as well as a demo showing me you know, how it works. And to do that um, all within four pages and maybe even have a couple of references at the end of that, like one or two, just showing that you know where the algorithm came from and shows me that you've gone out and, and tried to read some of that literature. So um, now if you, there, if you want to submit things like the code and stuff like that, I'm not asking you to submit the code, but if you want to submit stuff that you don't feel like will fit in that four pages, you can feel free to put an abstract of unlimited length, or you can think of it as an electronic supplementary material of unlimited length after it, but your four pages is meant to be um, complete. So somebody could pick up that four pages and could read just that four pages and be satisfied. If they want more info, you could give them opportunities to, oh, okay, I wanna go look at your code. Well, then you can go read that. But um, without the code, you should be able to read it and feel satisfied. So that's, that's what we're shooting for. And, um, and now the demo, you have to report on the demo. Um, say results from the demo in the report. So the PowerPoint and the report are supposed to be independent ways to present it. You should view this kind of like an academic conference. You would put all the details in your paper. Now this is an extended abstract, so it doesn't necessarily have to have all of the details, but you'd put um, the, the paper stands on its own and the presentation stands on its own. Of course, the presentation is not gonna have as many details as the paper, but the presentation is going to tell a complete story. And so the presentation has both parts. Here's the algorithm, here's the demo, but maybe with not as many details, there'll be more details in the paper, but the paper should say, um, similar the way you would if you were writing a paper about your own algorithm. Here is the algorithm. Here is how I've chosen to test the algorithm. Here are my results of that. And so, um, so the, the demo part really needs to be in the report as well. Okay.
Any other questions, administrative stuff? And the, um, the, so the, the final project, um, I, again, because the, because the technically, the, you know, the semester ends before finals week, so it ends at the end of this week. And so that's why I made the final report due on Saturday. And, um, and I need to give people time to review the one, uh, uh, the, the one presentation. So everybody has to have their presentations done by Wednesday uh, of this week, Wednesday at five o'clock. And the idea there, um, was that um, then the that everyone will then have adequate time to watch someone else's presentation and submit the peer review and so that's the reason why I make the presentations due in the middle of the week and then the report um, hopefully if you've already done the presentation you have enough content for the report so the report should be fine to be due uh, by uh, the Saturday there and um, and if if everybody, I, you know, because we do have class scheduled from 3.05 to 4.20 um, on Wednesday, I, I might be willing to extend the, the five o'clock deadline. Maybe I'll change that a little bit, massage it to be a little bit later. Um, uh, but I just want to make sure that that everyone has time from that Wednesday to that Saturday to watch someone else's PowerPoint or watch someone else's presentation and um, go through the rubric and submit their comments on the other person's presentation. You don't have a fixed slot for the presentation that you just upload. So anytime now, some people have already done it actually. There are people who have already submitted their report and their presentation. So uh, if you basically you know, go on to Zoom and there's instructions. So if you go to the presentation link, I give you um, some suggestions on how to do this. And so uh, you know, your two group members could join together on Zoom. One of them could share a screen. You can actually remotely control the screen. And then you have to then upload your presentation. And then Canvas automatically will assign one presentation to every student to review. So every student only has to review one presentation and that will be assigned by Canvas at the due date. And that's explained in the presentation link as well. So once that due date hits, then go back to that and uh, click on the peer reviews link and you should see that you now have an assignment and that assignment will be to watch someone else's. You'll click on that and their video that they uploaded will play and you'll be able to watch it and there'll be a rubric which you click show rubric and you'll see the rubric and you'll be able to tick uh, the boxes on the rubric on how well you think they did on those things and there'll be a comments box and then I'm just looking for a couple of sentences of constructive feedback on their presentation. The people who do the presentations, it's anonymous feedback. You, of course, know who they are, but they're not going to know who you are. Um, and so you can submit that feedback. And then uh, when I look at the presentations, which I can see all of them, then I will see everyone's feedback as well. And I can take into account everyone's feedback, everyone's scores, as well as my own views in coming up with um, my own uh, uh, scores and um, response to the rubric. So you only have to watch one presentation. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Great. Okay. Well, then uh, I'm going to clear the votes here. And so, and actually, we'll end up sharing some desktop here. And um, so, we've actually got some simulations that we'll be running during this class. So, um, we started talking last time about these interacting particle systems and generally these complex systems approaches um, to thinking about um, systems now it's a complex system systems approaches to thinking about computation And, um, you know, in this, you could even group into here this kind of buzzword emergent computation. So there's this term um, emergence that I don't really want to get into because this isn't formally a class just on complex systems. But um, if it were, we would kind of go through the taxonomy of all of these terms about, you know, what is a pattern, what is emergence, what is self-organization, what is adaptation, how do all these things relate and all that sort of thing. But, um, but basically, when we talk about something that is emergent, we're talking about something that, um, uh, that individuals by themselves 
uh, participate in the system and by themselves they have certain behaviors and when they get uh, interact with other individuals then you end up getting macro scale behavior that is not easily predictable by looking at the behavioral rules of an individual. So something that is not emergent, for example, is if um, I, uh, if a hundred of us have a coin in our pockets, that's a fair coin and we flip that coin, uh, and then some of them come up heads and some come up tails, then the, um, the demographics of how many people came up heads or like so the count of the heads in that hundred there's going to be roughly 50 heads and 50 tails and that you can view as a macroscopic parameter of the system that we have a balance of heads and tails but I wouldn't call that emergent what's emergent is like um, if you were to measure um, the amount of energy that you use as an individual in isolation every day doing a job and then you come together with a hundred other people and you're all doing a job, but now you're doing it together. And then you measure the energy that all of you are using um, together in that group together. And then suddenly you notice that it's not a hundred times the amount of energy that each individual uses. So in that case, there's some weird effect where an individual in a group ends up changing the feedback from the group changes how the individual operates in a way that uh, manifests itself as a group level property. And so that is what we refer to as sort of an emergent property. And then the question is whether that property is adaptive and all that. And so these um, studying emergence is sometimes difficult to do in a purely mathematical way because um, these rules are not necessarily easily formulated to math. And so sometimes we have to turn um, away from mathematics like we did. So in the, in the last lecture, we talked about kind of a more mathematical way to study consensus in this voter model where the voter model is sort of modeling the computation that comes in part through a selection process when there is no fitness difference. And so um, if we say, well, if we get to more complicated interacting particle systems, then uh, we may actually need to, to, turn, to turn to empirical methods to actually study them. And, um, and this is um, uh, kind of where, um, so Stephen Wolfram, um, oh, is a physicist who, um, this is the, if you're familiar with Mathematica, the software package, um, sort of responsible for that, is a physicist that um, it got big into this idea um, and wrote a book that was very popular called A New Kind of Science, which um, otherwise goes by the initialism NKS. And, um, and so Wolfram sort of talked about how if we can build these computational systems with uh, very simple rules and kick them off and study them like the way in which we study thermodynamic ensembles of particles in real physical systems, then we can end up exposing concepts that may not have been readily apparent through more formal methods that are kind of from the bottom up of doing you know, kind of proof first. And I'm not necessarily advocating for this new kind of science or whatever, but just mentioning that, that his name, Wolfram, will come up in a, in a lot of these sorts of things. So, so where, um, let's see where we're kind of going uh, with that. So as um, an example, uh, I'm going to like, um, so, so, a, so I'll mention cellular automata. or CAs are a special kind of interacting particle system where we divide up space into cells. And so we just, we just create a box around space and we divide things up into cells. And then we define rules for the evolution of the state of each cell based on the state 
of surrounding cells. And we can do this at a wide range of scales. So, um, so I'll just, as an example, I'm gonna share a different screen. So what I'm about to share is, so there's a, a cute little program that, um, um, that I'm gonna to cut to here in a second. So it'll cut away from this screen, but um, there's a, a program called NetLogo uh, from Yuri uh, Walensky. Um, I think it was at Northwestern when uh, NetLogo first came out. And it is primarily viewed as an agent based modeling tool. Um, but it's, um, it, because the way in which it simulates agents also generates um, types of agents which are stationary parts of the world, then it also ends up being very good for studying these kind of cellular automata. And so um, if I share my I'll use, I'm going to flip from my tablet to my desktop here. So go share screen. And I'll use this desktop. And so hop back into Zoom on the tablet to make sure that, all right, good. So now you're seeing um, over, so if you were to download NetLogo, you get a program that looks like this one. It kind of looks like an old school Java program here because that's exactly what it is. Uh, it's been updated since. Uh, and uh, it's got a bunch of preloaded examples as well as ways in which, so there's this models library with a, a bunch of these, these nice examples that have been pre-built. And then you can also go in uh, and so if I were to open one of these things, then I end up getting uh, a, you know, these relatively simple looking simulations like, uh, like this one, which I'll explain in a second. And you can go and read about the, the particular code that you download, and then you can actually go in and modify that code. It's a simple uh, coding language based on the old school logo. When I was a kid, uh, this is how we all learned uh, to program initially is using logo on, I think, an Apple IIGS, which is um, a simple language that has to do with moving turtles around a screen. So uh, I can uh, move a turtle. I can say I have that turtle moving up, moving down, turning right, turning left. I can have the turtle put its pin down and so on. Yeah, exactly. Forward, 40, right, 90, etc. And so uh, what uh, the NetLogo folks did is they, so there are a bunch of computer scientists uh, and exactly logo, right, is the, is the language. And, and so, and they wanted to create a language that will allow for sophisticated computational social simulations that were, would be attractive to social scientists without any background in computer science. And so um, rather than building um, uh, a language based off of a platform that was already out there, then they said, well, we know that Logo is effective in teaching people that don't have any background to do you know, relatively interesting things. Can we enhance Logo uh, so that we can have multiple agents working around each other so that they're relatively simple to program um, each individual agent, and then you can tell the program to instantiate a wide number or a huge number of them and then have them all uh, go at the same time so that you have these sort of parallel logo programs um, acting uh, on an environment and sharing an environment and communicating with each other. Thus, networked logo, net logo. And could you even do participatory simulation where you could have somebody on one computer is running a logo experiment um, and another per computer is running another and they can network to each uh, in the back end behind each other. So you could actually have groups do ex uh, you know, computational experiments in an agent based model where you could uh, perform with each other as humans as well as with computational agents. And so they wanted a, a simple way to do relatively complex things with an audience that wouldn't necessarily come from a computer science background. So that's where like logo came up in place. But um, I actually find it is a, um, 
the interface is nice. It's um, whenever I were and build an agent-based modeling tool on my own, like in a MATLAB or a C, I end up having to do a lot of scheduling stuff that I don't have to worry about because it's already done for me in Logo. Um, if you don't like using Logo, if you like to use Java, there is something called ReLogo in the Java-based uh, agent modeling tool, Repast. Um, R-E-P-A-S-T-E, that um, makes, gives you all of the kind of logo front end. It even allows you to import net logo uh, models into, but you can program in Java instead. And there's a bunch of other agent modeling based modeling tools. I'm bringing up here because it um, has a lot of canned examples that I can use to discuss cellular automata. And so, um, and what's nice about it is they've taken net logo, which was again, this downloadable Java program runnable on you know Linux, Windows, Mac, and they have turned it into a JavaScript engine. So any of your NetLogo programs, you well without except unless they access files and other things like that, uh, relatively self-contained ones, you can actually run them inside a web browser um, on a tablet even. And so if you were to Google NetLogo Web, um, then you'd end up getting um, this NetLogo Web here that you can launch and basically has everything in that logo, but running inside a browser. And so there's a models library that they have right inside that logo web here that allows you to search for the same models that you can find that, um, is, that are implemented in the desktop application. And this has worked really well for me because I often, let's say I do a simulation uh, if I want my stakeholders or my collaborators to be able to interact with the simulation, it's really a pain to have them downloading something or installing something, compiling something, et cetera. If I can just send them a web link, uh, then uh, it's, it's easier to get them to interact. And so that's one of the reasons why sometimes I try to write things in logo or in net logo, because it uh, allows for the sims to be communication and coordination tools. So here's Fire, for example, on the left here. And this is a cellular automaton that was meant not to tell us anything about computation. It was meant to be a empirical study of how forest fires might interact with the density of trees. So, um, so what you see here, which is identical to what you see um, on the, the right here on my desktop application, is a simulation where um, I set a density and I click setup, and basically there's um, every cell, which when I hit setup, you can see that the, the kind of resolution of the cells here is either green or black. A black cell, there's no tree there, a green one has the tree. And you can define very simple rules. So it, it's hard to see, but down the right hand or down the left hand side here, there's a bunch of red pixels. And those red pixels are trees that are on fire. And so it basically chooses randomly a set of trees on the left-hand side of this uh, world that it sets ablaze. And if there are trees that are, um, and I forget what the rules are here, I could go and look at them, but there's a deterministic rule that basically says that if you're a tree next to a tree that's on fire, then uh, in the next round of the simulation or the next simulation time step, you too will be on fire. And so if I were to hit go here, then I see, let me increase my density here, then I see that I can get a fire spreading across um, a stand of trees. And, um, and then and it turns out that if I change the initial densities, then the, you're, you can ask questions on like about how does the initial density affect the percent of the forest that ends up being burned after the fire has died out. And this you know, is very much related to um, how much of a population needs to be affected by a disease as the disease spreads. And so social densing or social distancing is very much like uh, reducing the density of individuals who could spread disease to other individuals. And what we learn from these forest fire models is that there is a critical density that um, below that critical density, if I keep setting this population up and rerunning it, then what I see is the forest fire dies out almost immediately. And I get very little of the forest that is burned. And, um, and it doesn't matter where I am, as long as I'm below that critical density, um, I get 
uh, maybe you know a, a little bit of an increase, but there is hardly any of an increase. But then once I go above that critical density, then um, it may change um, uh, slightly the patterns that are left in the wake, but effectively 100% of the forest gets burned. And those of you that might be familiar with maybe even folk uh, lore about epidemiology know that there's this, um, this basic reproduction number R0 that um, it also has a critical value. And it, the R0 is the product of um, how often people interact with each other, how infectious a, um, uh, a disease is, and how quickly people recover from a disease. And you basically multiply those things together and you end up getting a unitless number that if it's below one, a disease dies out in the population. If it's above one, it spreads and um, can touch almost the whole population. And basically, the amount of population that receives herd immunity is one divided by the basic reproduction number. So there's a similar feel here where there's this critical threshold where once you go over it, you end up uh, basically spreading throughout a population. And if you're under it, you're not able to spread. I'm bringing all this up because this is an example of a 2D cellular automaton. You set up cells, they have states, I'm on fire, I'm a tree, or I'm just an empty space. And those, each of those have a simple update rule. If I'm next to a tree that's on fire, I catch on fire next. Um, otherwise, I stay in whatever my previous state was. Or the one that's on fire is if I'm on fire now, then um, the next uh, state, um, I become an ember, which basically just means that I'm marked that I was on fire, so, um, but I'm not on fire anymore. So there's a slight uh, difference in the, in the initial trees that are kind of a bright red as they go across and the light red that they leave in their wake. So this is one example of how you can use cellular automata to investigate these physical processes like the spreading of, um, of these things at a very large scale. Now, when we think about neural networks, we think about neurons. And I said neurons are a type of interacting particle system. And there is a, another two-dimensional um, uh, CA here that's called Brian's Brain that was actually just built um, as an example of what you could do with these things by the, the guy who created NetLogo, Uri Walensky. And in Brian's Brain, um, you basically <clears throat> have a bunch of cells like these, and they are meant to look like neurons. And these neurons are connected to the neurons around them. And these neurons are either on, white, they're, they're firing, um, or and if I go down here in this model info down here, then I can see that they're firing the white cells. Then the next step become refractory cells. So you might remember when we drew those spikes for spiking neural networks, there was a spike in the fire and then immediately after the spike, then there was a refractory period where the neuron ceases to be uh, stimulated by the neurons around it. And similarly, he has a refractory which um, will end up dying and turning off in the next time step. So once you fire, you become refractory. And a, if you're a black cell, which is you can think of as a quiescent neuron, a neuron just sitting there, if there are two neighbors that are white next to you, then you will become white. So this is like simulating a neuron, where a neuron needs exactly two neighbors that are firing for that neuron to fire. And then after it fires, it becomes refractory, basically unresponsive, so that it doesn't pay attention to its neighbors. And then after it's refractory, then it becomes um, uh, responsive again, becomes black again. So it's a simple way to simulate what would happen if you put a bunch of neurons on a grid connected to those around it and assumed that they were weighted to the other neurons with this simple rule. And if I um, set things up randomly, I can hit go once, which is just a round of that. And you can see that um, a bunch of neurons that, um, so the red neurons there are neurons that are, were on, fired, and now they have gone refractory. And the white ones are ones that were black, but had two white neurons next to them. And they've now been born as fired neurons. So if I were to go once again, those red ones become black and the old white ones become red. And this goes on and on. And so if I hit go forever, then I get these cute little patterns where there are these um, so-called gliders. So there are structures that end up happening across the two-dimensional space. 
And so this is not necessarily a realistic depiction of what might go on inside a brain, but if you were to see um, waves of patterns going on over top of a brain of these, um, of these activating uh, elements, then this provides us a conceptual tool to think about where these coherent structures might come from. Uh, because in this simple tool with this kind of simple model of a neuron, we also get these complex structures. Now, some of you may have heard of the game of life. And I mentioned that I think last week, John Conway, who recently died, came up with this two-dimensional um, this two-dimensional cellular automaton called the, uh, the game of life that um, is, operates similar to the Brian's brain, um, but it has a slightly more complicated, um, I'm sure they summarize the rules here, but <clears throat> basically um, he would talk about if you're a black cell, if there are a certain number of white cells around you, then you'll become white in the next period because it's like there's been reproduction. But if you're a white cell and there's too many white cells around you, you'll die due to overpopulation. Um, but um, if there's, um, so you've got the production of white cells and the death of white cells. And if there's a, just the right amount of white cells, you'll stay a white cell. So then you've got kind of a stable population. So with these rules, you can do something similar where you let this thing go forever. And what you end up getting is um, also the formation of consistent structures, as well as some of these gliders. And what's interesting when we compare these two is that in the game of life with its large number of rules, you get only a small set of structures that have the ability to glide across the screen. Whereas in Brian's brain, you get a wide range of gliding patterns that go across the screen. So it opens up these questions about how do the number of computational rules we have constrain the macroscopic features that we might want. So these are just examples of how you can use CAs to probe the large scale, how do forest fires work, the small scale, how do patterns work uh, across the surface of a brain, um, and just a more abstract scale of how does the number of rules in, say, a distributed computational system constrain all of the things that could happen at the macro scale um, of that system. And so these are um, examples of, um, of what you can do at least in 2D. But I want to dial it back a little bit and just, um, and I'm going to cut back to the, uh, the lecture notes here. But are there any questions on this 2D example? I'm just trying to motivate some ways in which cellular automata can be used in these 2D empirical investigations. And these are all written in relatively simple net logo code. So down here. I see what's the purpose of studying these patterns. So this goes back to that Stephen Wolfram type of uh, new kind of uh, science. So um, for example, uh, I give this fire example um, to some of my uh, simulation students in an early lab trying to show how empirical studies can end up allowing us to test hypotheses about, for example, is there a linear relationship between density and the amount of uh, forest that gets burned. Well, we can't actually go out and burn a forest and we might wanna test this really simple idea. How does density relate to the amount of forest that it's being burned? And you might assume ahead of time that there's a linear relationship. It turns out it's a nonlinear relationship. There's just a critical density. Above that density, everything gets burned. Below that density, everything doesn't. So these CAs provide empirical uh, um, evidence, justification, uh, for or against certain hypotheses for how systems might work. And so they're, um, they're meant to be laboratories, computational laboratories. Now, as we'll see, um, as we make the CAs even simpler, we can start studying, can a system like this actually do something like computation? Can I build a distributed system of cells that only pays attention to the cells next to it and figure out a way to come up with initial conditions of those cells to have this do a computation for me? And how many computations can I have it, do, it done for me? Can I have it add two numbers? Can I have it divide two numbers? And so on and so forth. And if so, 
does this show me that maybe I don't need a traditional computer architecture to do things that we view as uh, executing an, an algorithm? Uh, maybe I can actually execute an algorithm uh, without thinking about things like memory. Uh, like, do I have a specific spot for memory? Do I have a specific spot for um, uh, storing my instructions and so on and so forth? And pardon me, I'm getting a, a Google voice call. Okay, good, it's gone now. Great, all right. So, um, so let's then, so are there any other questions about these kind of 2D examples here of, um, of these CAs, fire, neurons, and just, you know, light? All right, so I'm gonna switch back to sharing. All right, so. Stop the share here, let me restart the share over here. All right, good. All right, so um, just to keep things simple, then we're gonna focus here on a subset of CAs called elementary CAs. And I hope, and I will, um, and I'll mention this more explicitly uh, whenever possible, I hope you can see that uh, neural networks and CAs, uh, you can view a cellular automaton, um, these elementary cellular automatons as, as being implementable by a neural network. You could build a neural network that would implement the same rules that I'm talking about for these elementary CAs. And so any great uh, things that we do with ECAs, any computational results that we get out of ECAs actually apply to neural networks as well. So um, I'm going to show uh, you that there's a certain um, rule that in CAs that is so-called Turing complete, which basically means it's a general purpose computer. And so that also means that neural networks are Turing complete. So, um, and we'll get to that here in a second. And so, yes, the structure of this is a question, will the data structure of the models impact the results? Grid, yes, absolutely is that the uh, uh, CAs, the computational abilities of CAs are going to be affected um, by the topology of the CA and so on and so forth. If you go back to thinking about the last lecture, we had that interacting particle system which modeled, uh, which you could also view as a kind of a more generalized CA, and that modeled what happened, um, it's, it's actually a stochastic cellular automaton, um, what happened with a population and whether that population reached consensus on a strategy. And we, show, we talked about how in one dimension and in two dimensions, then the society will reach consensus or the population will fixate on one strategy. But in three dimensions or higher, then there is not a 100% probability that the group will fixate on a single strategy. So it just goes to show that how you connect these things together and the dimensionality and so on and so forth actually affects the computational outcomes of these rules. Okay, so in, a, um, in an elementary CA, what we do is we're, we're, we're just focusing on the one dimensional case here. This is a one dimensional CA. And so it's, you think of this as, so maybe I'll just use the boxes that are already on here. And so for simplicity, you can think of this as going in both directions infinitely, although um, very often instead of infinitely, we talk about uh, having periodic boundary conditions instead. So uh, this could be periodic boundaries or infinite length. And so we have these cells, and these cells are only gonna have two states, which we will just name zero and one. 
So it might be, um, you know, we've got you know, whatever. ones and zeros. And so then we can view uh, each cell. We can then talk about how the cells change from one generation to another. So even though we're only worried about 1D, we can draw every generation as another row of kind of a growing matrix. And so um, you can think of this as the first generation here. And then you can think of underneath that, you might have a second generation. And whatever the boundary conditions were are going to be the same. And um, so then, you know, how do you get from one place to the other? And so um, the question is, how do I decide what to put in this cell given all of the cells that are above it. And in an elementary CA, then the assumption is that we only focus on the three cells directly above the cell in the new generation. And so it's like these little Tetris blocks where um, we are basically going to say for every three bit pattern in the previous generation, that is going to fix the bit in the next generation. So um, you can basically think of uh, this as having, um, this is almost like having a, a focal cell and the new value of that focal cell and um, a value to the left and a value to the right. And so each, and so our CA rules basically say, um, given that your value is this focal value and your neighbors are the left neighbor and the right neighbor, then what will your new value be in the next generation? And you take this little, this little template and you then slide it all the way across this until you've populated everyone in the, next, in the bottom row. And then you can do that in the next generation and then the next generation. And, um, and so, you know, as an example, so we can then, um, because there's eight possible three-bit combinations that come from the previous generation, then we can write the entire rule for how one generation gets to the next in eight, uh, in eight bits, basically. We can, um, we can say, like, let's say, for example, I can say, well, if I had um, one, 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 um, in the previous, for the previous three, left, focal, and right. If that, I'll say that produces a zero. And let's say that instead I had one, uh, one, zero, and I'm gonna say that also produces a zero. And I have one, oh, one. Well, maybe that produces a one. If I have one, zero, zero, that produces a zero. Um, I'm gonna move this over a little bit so I can get eight of these in here. Then I've got um, 011, and that produces a 1, 010, that produces a 1, um, 001, that produces a 0, and 000, that produces a 0. So if as long as my uh, ordering of, so these are, you can view these up here. And maybe it's a good idea for me to highlight them separately. You can view these as the possible input scenarios. And then in the bottom, you can view these as the corresponding output for each scenario. And as long as I order my input scenarios in a consistent way, then when I communicate this to someone else, I only have to communicate to them the outputs in that order. And so I can refer to this cellular automaton rule as this bit string down here. 
So I can refer to this as rule 00101100. And, um, and so that is the rule in binary. But binary is a mouthful. And so um, those of you who are electrical engineers um, will at some point in your career learn to look at binary and every group of four bits you'll associate with a hexadecimal digit. And so I could instead refer to this as 2C, which is, um, which sometimes we might do zero by, which just means hexadecimal, which is the hexadecimal version of this rule. So, um, or um, because uh, these ECAs were formulated by physicists and computer scientists who have a tendency not to necessarily think in hex, um, then you can also say, well, couldn't I just specify it in decimal? Because that's what I'm more comfortable with. And so I could also refer to this as rule uh, 44. So this is also um, 44 in decimal. So um, in other words, uh, you know, two times 16 plus 12 gives me 44. So these are um, three equivalent names for this C, or I'll say ECA rule. And I think most of uh, the time that when it gets publicized uh, to the general public, as people think in decimal in the general public, then it's just the decimal numbers used, rule 44. Me personally, I hate decimal naming for ECAs because I can't see the rule. When you say 44, I have no idea what that tells me. If you tell me the binary version, if because I can train myself based on this ordering, then I can see what that rule means. I mean, that rule means to me that if there are two neighboring zeros, um, and uh, so let's, let's look at these two cases. So in these two cases down here, I have two neighboring zeros, and I keep the focal one. So that tells me that if, um, if you are surrounded by zero, then you just keep your old value. Um, so I can start making these interpretations. I can say, under what conditions do I keep my value? Under what conditions do I switch my value? And so on and so forth. And if I can see the bit string, then it's easier for me in my mind to ask what is going on here. And so, um, so you know, as uh, an example, um, there are rules like, let me pick a couple that get kind of closer to the, so for example, rule 184 is also known as the traffic rule. And if I um, were to write that out, then I'll do it. Um, so I'm going to write out the indices across the top. So these are the input scenarios. So 111, 110, 101, 100, 011, 001, 001, 000, 000. And, um, and then for this case, it's a zero, 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 and then a one, and then a one, one, zero, one. And so um, this is rule 184. And so the question that I have for you is why might we call this the traffic rule? And so think about that and try to come up with an answer to that. I'm going to um, see in the next generation zero one, um, so there's, right now, th these are deterministic rules. And so there's a question about probability. Um, so it's the inputs up here. These are all of the possible inputs that you could have 
Um, so these are all of the ways you could combine three bits from the input and every output will have three bits above it. And so this is just a, deter it's a specification of a deterministic mapping from any input bit string to any bit string in the next generation. So there's no probability here and it's not like fair or unfair or anything like that. If, if I have a one, 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 then in the next generation, I get a one. All right, so, um, so any thoughts as to why we might call this, and let me just make sure that I didn't mess anything up here. Right, okay. Yes. I feel like I'm just double checking that I didn't um, make a typo when I wrote 184 out is my trouble with 184 is that I can't see the bits. Um, mm. Got it, yes, all right. Yeah, all right, so I'm good now. Um, so does anyone have a guess as to why this might be called the traffic rule, just by looking at these things. Is there an interpretation we can get? Or in other words, a hint here is how might this rule simulate traffic? Um, nothing to do with traffic signals. Let's think about like in the forest fire example, then every cell represented the presence or absence of a tree uh, and whether that tree was on fire. So in this case, you could imagine that um, a, uh, uh, in this cellular automaton, you might be modeling a string of cars. And so I see um, in the chat here, Ones represent cars moving around and they follow rules like cars shouldn't crash. I like that. Um, so, um, so if following up on that, then how does this rule represent, or how does this right here represent that? I see overtaking the next car. Yeah. But not three lanes. So my, my other hint here is that this is one lane of traffic. So you can view this as a single lane of traffic. And my hint is that there be um, cars moving, say, that direction. It's, um, I see a comet here. It, um, it stays in front of you, um, is moving, you move. So, oh, it stays if in front of you. Um, is moving, and I think it's otherwise you move. So I think, yeah, this is kind of the basic idea here, is if we, if we think of um, each one of these scenarios, you're gonna say that if I lived in a world where cars, so this is a model of traffic where cars move in cells. So I have a car that's here, and so this here is an empty space. And this here is a car. So then the question you have to ask, um, and I, the question you have to ask for this traffic rule, and this is a standard term used to refer to 184. And so this 184, um, by the way, is the standard kind of uh, ECA terminology for naming this rule. And so um, if this is your current time step, then what we see here is that this car must wait to move 
but this car can move and this car can move and they all are trying to move in that direction and so what we are seeing here is that this rule up here this represents that um, you know no one can move and specifically not just no one can move but this middle car cannot move but this part this scenario says that the middle car can move and it will take up the next step and it will leave a zero a little bubble in its wake and that bubble is what is showing up down here so this outcome means that the car stays in place um, this outcome down here means that this car in the middle has moved and has been replaced with a zero and so on and so forth and so um, if i were to focus on this rule down here then we see that this guy is moving up this one here we see this one's moving up this one here this one is staying stuck this one is moving this one um, is this zero there's nobody to move into it so it just stays as a zero and this one here there's nobody to move into the middle cell so it stays as a zero so the outcomes are what will happen to the middle cell given that we're simulating traffic that where the positions in the previous generation are where the cars are zero being empty space and one being where a car is and so this traffic rule if i were to switch back so if i were to share my uh, my screen so back to this um, NetLogo web, for example. Good. Um, so shared, I think, the wrong desktop. We'll pull this over here then. Pull this over here. All right, yep, we got everything there. All right, so if I were to go and um, just look for 1D Elementary, which uh, they have something for that, then there's this nice tool inside NetLogo where I can simulate all of these things. And so I can go up here and under rule, I can type 184 and I can say show rules. And you see that it will put on top of here the traffic rule for 184. And so just put it right up on the top so I can quickly visualize, uh, so I can make sure that this is what I want. And it happens to order them um, in a different order. So it's like a big Indian, little Indian thing. So it puts the most significant bit on the other side, uh, but this is still 184. They just reversed it so that 111 is on the right and 000 is on the left. Um, and I can set up a random initial condition um, say I'll do a density of 44, so set random. And then if I am to hit go, then what you see here is the, um, you see cars moving. And so there are initially some traffic jams up here. So these are cars, they move and then they, they hit each other and they have to wait on each other to, to move to get out of the way. But eventually, uh, at some time, they end up spacing each other out so that they all have enough space that they each have room to move in the next step. And so I end up getting traffic moving in one direction. So there's a transient period and then everything moves in one direction. So you have to think about this. So there's a question that I can't see cars. So if I were to, I'm gonna use my other tablet here. Um, <clears throat> you have to think about this in terms of time is moving down um, and space is moving across. And so in these space-time diagrams, which are very common in traffic engineering, then, um, then in order to see the cars moving, you don't look for cars moving in one line. You look, look at how the line changes. And so um, this, the fact that I see this pattern that is moving down and to the right indicates that cars are moving in this direction because they started out, say here, and in the next they went here, and the next they went here, and then here and here. So the pattern that was in the first row then gets translated a little bit and translated a little bit. And so we're seeing translation 
And that translation happens as the rows keep moving. So that's uh, each green dot is a car. And the fact that we see stripes moving down to the right means that we're moving in that direction. Now, um, let's see, what are the squares? And so, I mean, each little dot is, a, so each green represents a, uh, you can, if I were to zoom in on this, which I can't do um, here, um, I don't think this CA, the way it's written, has allowed me to change the resolution. But, um, but each, if you were to zoom in, each green that you see is a green dot. Um, oh, and I'm sorry, yeah, if, if, I don't know how these, there might be, if you happen to see a little bit of a moire effect inside here, that is just a sampling issue that um, it's a higher resolution pattern that is being translated over Zoom. So if you happen to see like any little, you know, square patterns or something that are showing up inside here, that's just a visual artifact. The big pattern you're supposed to see is that you're getting movement that is from down into the right. And the reason I'm, I'm highlighting that is when you get to a, if I clear all of these comments here, if I get to a critical density and set this up again and hit go, then now I see actually that I now get the pattern now moves down into the left. So now this is um, a backward moving, and I, I realize now that I'm writing red on green, which I did not mean to do. Um, so I'll clear that and draw blue here. So this is a backward moving wave. And these uh, you know, clusters here, these are tight groups of cars. And these, um, the black lines are basically space between cars. And so what you're seeing now is actually a simulation of, uh, of a high traffic environment where everyone is in deadlock and you have to wait for these backward moving waves um, of the deadlock kind of, uh, or of, the, um, of these little bubbles between cars to move backwards. So rather than viewing everyone moving forwards, we're actually viewing a backward moving wave as, as you make room, that room bubbles backwards. And so this is what happens when these systems reach a critical density, you get this backward wave instead of a forward wave. Whereas if I instead were to go at a lower density, like only 23% cars, then again, I get some transient effects. So I can maybe stop this in there. And so there is, there are some transients, but most of the flow has got this forward moving wave. So it shows that this very simple rule 184 um, is, you know, this, this traffic rule is that although it's extremely simple, it actually reconstructs dynamics that we see in real systems. So it's this cool, you know, um, uh, traffic rule. So that's where we get this kind of traffic rule. And there's a bunch of other, um, I, I guess what I, I want to get, before we only have five more minutes here, so I want to at least get to um, the, and the transients, by the way, represent uh, the, the kind of um, cars um, reaching adequate spacing. And so initially the cars are kind of too close together. Um, and so some get stuck against the other ones, but then eventually they get out of the way. And so they end up making enough space for each other and then they end up getting locked into formation. So the transients are them finding the formation that they can become locked into and then they move smoothly in that formation for else the rest of it. So, um, so this is kind of a complex uh, behavior. Your car doesn't move backward on the highway. The, but the space in between the cars moves backwards. So if you're stuck on, uh, on the 10 in a high density situation, you're always moving forward, but 
there is a wave of space that bubbles backwards through the traffic. And so someone in front of you uh, opens up space and then that space goes behind you, and behind you, and behind you. At that point, the dynamics of the traffic are actually the empty space bubbling backward and not the positive space moving forward. So we see that in real systems and this is actually simulated inside this 1DCA. Now, the last thing I wanna mention about the traffic rule is you can interleave the traffic rule with, um, with another rule that um, I am not going to um, go into another rule called the majority rule. So I'll just mention here that rule 232 is called the majority rule. And you can probably guess why it's called the majority rule. So it basically, um, it, based on the three that are above it, the next cell immediately underneath those is gonna take whatever the majority uh, cell type was above it. And if you combine those two together, then you can end up actually getting a density classifier. So um, this, notice this is a low density. If I let this thing run till the end, if I then switch to rule 232 instead, and then let that go using the, the exiting condition, condition of rule 184 uh, as the initial condition for 232, then notice that everything goes all black. And this will happen if I do 184 again, if I were to start another random uh, density, as long as I'm at a low density and hit go, then these, uh, yes, these rule numbers are unanimously accepted. So this is the standard way of viewing these rules, calling them by this, this decimal numbering system. And so these rules that, um, uh, yeah, so that ends up establishing this traffic pattern. If I then again switch back to 232, the majority rule, and then hit go again and take over from there again, all black. Now, if I go to a high density, so if I go back to my 184 and I hit uh, go for hit random and then have it go again, now I've got the backward moving wave. And if I then switch now to 232 and hit go, then I'm gonna see them go all green. So the combination of 184 plus 232 is a density classifier. So basically, um, if you combine these two, if you run enough rounds of 184, followed by enough rounds of 232, your CA will come to consensus, and whatever its consensus value will be um, an, an estimate an accurate estimate of whatever the density was at the initial conditions. So if you didn't know what the density was, you could run 184 for a while, then run 232 for a while. And if 232 came out all green, then you knew you originally were at a density of 50% or higher. If instead you did that same process and 232 ended up all black, then your initial density was 49% uh, or lower. So the combination of these two rules can do a computation. So that's one example of these things. Um, I don't wanna go into too much more detail because I'm at 420, but I do want to at least mention one other rule, rule 110. And so this rule 110, um, so I'll clear this here, is Turing complete. And basically what I'm saying here is I can, uh, so yeah, I can set up a random pattern and I can hit go and I get a really fancy, pretty pattern that comes out of it. Sure, great. But it turns out that you can show, you can prove that you can set up the initial conditions as long as it's wide enough. You can create a wide enough CA and you can end up programming whatever program you want in the initial conditions of this CA. And so 110 is like a programming language in CAs. And as long as you know how to write there, and there's a kind of a tag format you have to learn about it, but any single program, any computer program you can think of that you could write on a computer like the one that's sitting in front of you, you can actually execute on rule 110. And rule 110, again, this is a standard way of naming things, is just a distributed way of having one cell relate to the cells next to it. You put all of those together and you get a computer. 
It doesn't have memory. It doesn't have an instruction. Uh, you know, it doesn't have a, a, a place where it stored the instruction. It doesn't have a hard disk, but it can actually do any computation. All right. So um, it's kind of a combination of a lot of things. I'm happy to make those, those comments a little more precise on Wednesday, or I'm happy on Wednesday to just go back and reflect upon the rest of the class in preparation for the final exam. Um, it's 4.20, so I'm going to let you guys go who needs to go. Anyone who has questions, I'll leave the, uh, the line on until 4.30 here, and, um, and, and then it's Monday, so then I'll flip to my office hours after that. So again, if you need to leave, feel free. Are there any questions that I can answer for anyone else who can stay, stick around? All right, looks like everybody is heading out. So in that case, I will um, end the, uh, the Zoom call here and I'm happy to take any other questions in office hours. Oh, I do see a question here. What if the algorithm we've chosen is not the best for the problem? That's fine. Really, all you need to do for your final project is just demonstrate that you have a, uh, a good understanding of the algorithm and you've built a demo that demonstrates how the algorithm works. It's fine if your algorithm doesn't work as better as, as well as another algorithm. If you can at least show that your demo shows that the algorithm could work and potentially could get tuned, then, then that's fine. You're basically just showing the reader, introducing the reader to an algorithm and giving them a demo that helps make it more solid on how the algorithm works. Okay.